Did you know that the global edge computing market size is expected to grow from a $53.6 billion industry in 2023 to $101.3 billion by 2028? So based on those numbers, there is a strong possibility that you, my Chalk Talk watching audience, are working on an edge computing application or have in the past, or will in the future. So, what are your biggest design concerns when it comes to edge computing designs? I'd bet that security, reliability, and power efficiency are on the top of your list. So what if I said that this here Chalk Talk was about all of that and more? What if I said that not only are we addressing reliability, power efficiency, and security for edge computing applications, but we're also making these designs a reality with the help of Linux, RISC-V, and Polar Fire SOC FPGAs. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Diptesh Nandi from Microchip and I examine the benefits of Polar Fire SOC FPGAs for edge computing applications. We explore how the RISC-V based architecture, asymmetrical multiprocessing, and Linux based reference solutions make these SOC FPGAs a game changer for edge computing applications. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Microchip. Hi, Diptesh. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Likewise. So we're talking about Polar Fire SOC FPGAs today and how we can integrate Linux into our edge nodes. But before we get started, what all will we be covering today? Yeah, I want to quickly introduce the Polar Fire SOC FPGA family. What are the features that enable our customers to solve their problems? And then I'm going to go over the hardware and software ecosystem. And then I'm going to give a couple of examples of how customers use our FPGAs by showcasing some solutions and screenshots. Fantastic. All right. So we have covered edge computing here on Chalk Talk quite a bit. But as time goes on, more and more computation is happening on the edge, right? Yeah, exactly. We typically play in the edge computing market and edge for us is typically any application that is not data center. And what's surprising is we've always seen customers do more and more compute in edge applications, whether those are integrated automation or medical diagnostics, vehicles, satellites, etc. What is interesting is the analysts that we hear and talk with, they are predicting that over three-fourths of all enterprise-related data will be created outside the edge, and they will expect those data to be processed on the edge devices. So we are gearing up for more and more compute on edge devices, which is good because that's where we actually play. The other sort of trend that sounds really interesting is the adoption of AI and machine learning. So AI is a generic term, but whenever you run small AI algorithms on edge devices, we call it machine learning, offers a lot of scope of improving our lives and our much more smarter designs. So we are really interested in this trend, and we feel that we are well-suited and well-placed to be playing in this market. So what does Microchip offer to address the challenges of edge computing? Yeah, sure. So there are three big reasons why it is extremely challenging to design any embedded systems on the edge. As and when the compute requirements increase, you need to do more and more stuff. Maybe you're trying to run a camera, you're trying to run a machine learning algorithm, but the edge devices are typically small. And the biggest concern that designers have is as and when you increase compute, you need to make your designs power efficient. Our FPGAs offer two times more power efficiency compared to our competitions. Remember, we, we, we are talking FPGAs to FPGAs. The other aspect of edge devices is reliability. You are installing systems that are expected to run for decades to come. FPGAs typically have designs that go on for like 10, 15, 20 years. So it is important for FPGAs to be exceptionally reliable. 
and especially the FPGAs that we make. Uh, not only they go into industrial devices, but we play in automation, we play in communications, uh, we play in avionics, in satellites. So once you put a satellite up in space, there's no coming back. So you need to ensure that your edge device is exceptionally reliable. Finally, there's a concept of physical security, right? So there's no guns or gates that is guarding an extremely complicated device that is increasing its compute capability. So how do you ensure that your devices are secure? It is protected against cyber intrusions or it is protected against tamper. And we offer all those three things. So with, with Polarfire FPGAs, we have extremely power efficient, reliable and secure platform that comes with a SoftRISC 5 processor. With Polarfire SOC, we have hardened that SoftRISC 5 into a hard SOC that is capable of running real-time Linux. And whenever we have a portfolio that works in the commercial market, we also make it radiation tolerant. That enables us to target applications like satellites or spacecrafts or missiles or satellite launch vehicles and so forth. So a combination of these three problems, power efficiency, reliability, and security is something that we really focus on when we try to design your new portfolio. And that's why I think our products are well suited in this market, especially when we're talking about more and more edge compute sort of outside the data center. All right, so Dibtesh, let's get into the details about the Polar Fire SOC. Sure. Polar Fire SOC is an SOC FPGA. What it means is it is a combination of an FPGA which comes with a hardened processor. We offer extremely low power consumption. Our devices can start giving you performance up to 6,000 core marks at like 1.5 watts. Whereas that is a limit where our competitive devices, whether it's a dual core Cortex A9 or a dual core Cortex A53, they don't even start booting up at that 1.5 milliwatt power range. So we make extremely low power, extremely power efficient FPGAs and SOCs. We offer a better memory support. We offer twice the amount of transceiver speeds. We offer more IOs, more DSP, more RAM that you require to do your computations compared to similar FPGAs and SOC FPGAs in the mid-range market, which we classify as like 500,000 logic elements or more. The Polarfire platform offers best-in-class security suit for customers who are really trying to make their devices secure. We offer EPA resistance, resistant bitstream programming. We offer anti-tamper features. Polarfire platform has about 32 tamper flags that can get triggered if someone tries to actively probe the FPG and take out the secret sauce. We assure customer's design environment is completely secure. Every FPGA in our portfolio up to a package level can be uniquely earmarked. So every FPGA has a unique ID that you and I don't know but using that unique ID, you can ensure that your designs are programmed securely, even if it is done at a remote location. We have crypto coprocessors that basically offload the performance that you would spend if you do not have a crypto coprocessor, as in whenever you're trying to do encryption or decryption of keys, you can do that without using any FPGA resources. And that crypto processor is side channel resistant. When we talk about Polify SOC, the SOC component adds in features like Secure Boot. It adds protection against Spectre and Meltdown attacks. You have physical memory protection, and we ensure that all the memories inside the embedded system are secure and they are protected. So what we call this is a term called SecDead. If there's a single bit flip that happens on a memory, we automatically correct it. If there's a double bit flip, we ensure that you, the designer, knows about it and you know that something wrong has happened. After security is reliability. So we target markets and areas that require extremely high reliable long-term operation devices. We play in space, in commercial and military aviation. We have a claim that anything that flies today, whether it's a commercial passenger airliner, whether it's a fighter aircraft, whether it's a missile that goes in a tank or a ballistic missile that basically covers large distances, our FPGAs are involved. And the way we do that is by providing a fabric that is immune to single event upsets. Our FPGAs have zero fit neutron immunity for FPGA configuration cells, along with the fact that our 
memories also have SegDet protection, customers get to make really reliable designs if they start putting in our FPGA into their designs. If a customer is purchasing an FPGA, we do not obsolete that part. And as you can see from the chart here, we have shipping parts since 1995. And the oldest part that you see in the chart, we still guarantee shipment up to the next 10 years. The green dotted line keeps on changing to the right every year. As long as customers purchase parts and as long as we are not sort of limited by an external party, PJ, we will continue to make them. And the commitment to our customers that we continue manufacturing our parts for a long, long time. So can we talk a bit more in depth about the Polar Fire SOC? Specifically, what does the processor subsystem look like? So it is the first industry's RISC-V offering along with an FPGA. So we have taken a deviation from what our competitors do, which is uh, use the most common incumbent processor core. There was a lot of reasons why we chose to use RISC-V. One of them was that RISC-V is open ISA. And it is very, very critical for some of our safety critical customers to be able to inspect the ISA to ensure that there's no Trojan instructions that has gone inside. Going the RISC-V way allows us to offer them this facility. The processor subsystem has quad core RISC-V processor cores. They run up to 667 megahertz per core. We offer hard DDR4 and LPDDR4 that can directly be connected to the processor system. Our processors can run Linux, real-time OS, and bare metal, and they can run them simultaneously together, two at a time, using a method called asymmetric multiprocessing. Finally, the processor subsystem is also secured with a procedure called Secure Boot. This basically enables the customer or a designer to ensure every time FPGA or an SOC FPGA boots, designer has the capability to verify the Linux image before booting. And after the boot has happened, he or she can choose to even program the fabric portion as well. So secure boot is our commitment towards really provide, providing the best in class security on a mid-range FPGA platform today. Okay, so can we talk about the fabric subsystem? Of course. So the fabric for Polar Fire SOC is non-volatile fabric. We call it as Sonos. It's a 28 nanometer process. When we say non-volatile, what it means is you do not have to load the bitstream from an external spy flash every time you want to boot up this FPGA. This enables our portfolio almost an instant on kind of a capability. We boot up faster and maybe sometimes thousand times faster than a typical SRAM FPGA because of this reason. This enables us to participate in applications that require like initial bootloader stage kind of applications like power sequencing, voltage monitoring, or really think of ballistic missile that has to like really wake up as soon as possible as it is launched and then figure out the route, and then follow the route that has been predetermined, right? Instant on is something that is enabled by a Sonos fabric, which is non-volatile. We have a PCIe subsystem that is driven by up to 24, 12.7 GBPS Cerdis. 12.7 GBPS is a sweet spot for a lot of vision applications. If you talk about HDMI, it's uh, 4K60 goes up to 10 GBPS. If you talk about CoExpress, the current protocol goes up to 12.5 GBPS. If you are talking about the broadcast market where SDI is popular, goes up to 12 GBPS again. Display port goes up to 8.1 GBPS and USB 3 vision or gigabit Ethernet vision all are at about 10 GBPS. So we offer a service that is really optimized for most vision processing kind of applications. Because of this optimization, we also realized much more lower power than, let's say, a large FPGA that was designed to operate at maybe 30 GBPS. And then because of your requirements in vision, you only have to offer or to run that transceiver at about 12. But when you're trying to run a transceiver at 12, which was designed for 30, you probably won't get the kind of power optimization that you're looking for a design. So anyway, so that's our beauty of targeting mid-range FPGAs, really, really focused towards video and imaging kind of protocols. We have two PCIe Gen 2 controllers, and our high-speed IOs go up to 1.6 GBPS. What it means is we can run DDR4, 
and LPDDR4 directly through our HSIOs, along with uh, DDR3, LPDDR3, and lower memories as well. The Polar Fire SOC block diagram looks like this. The orange portion is obviously the microprocessor subsystem. The blue portion in the middle is the fabric which you use to create your IPs. It is also interspersed and mixed with multiple math blocks. We have 18 by 18, a bunch of micro and large SRAMs, as well as clocking structure. And we run our PCI Gen 2 controllers on top of those transceivers as well. We connect the L1 cache to a pretty large 2 megabyte of L2 cache that can be configured to run as a scratch pad memory. It can be configured to run with indeterministic memory modes. We can even pin certain sections of the L2 cache so that whenever there's a cache refresh, those pinned areas are retained. Finally, the L2 cache gets connected to the physical LPDDR3, 4, or DDR3, 4 memory using the DDR5. On the top left side, you'd see a block called system controller. The system controller is essentially responsible for instantiating the whole FPGA. It is responsible for programming the FPGA, ensuring that the training IPs get started, ensuring that system services and all security services all, all get started for the whole FPGA. On the right-hand side, you have the microprocessor peripheral. So we have a crypto block. We have two gigabit Ethernet Macs directly connected to the SOC. We have support for MMC 5.1, which means that we can connect an SD card or a EMMC socket. There are two kind controllers, Watt Spy support, I2C Spy UART support, and finally USB 2.0 OTG. The SOC is connected to the fabric using what we call as a FIC interface or a fabric interconnect. It is basically an AMBA switch, but inside it's an AXI4 interconnect with APB support as well. All right. So what kind of hardware platforms does Microchip offer when it comes to the Polar Fire SOC? At this point of time, we have two kits. As you can see here, the kit on the left is called the Polar Fire SOC Video Kit. The kit on the right is called the Polar Fire SOC Icicle Kit. It's a lower cost, lower featured version that enables customers to get started quickly with a lower budget in mind. The Polify SOC video kit, it is really intended for complete evaluation of the FPGA with a specific horizontal in mind, which is embedded video and embedded vision. Two Sony cameras, they can go up to 4K60 and we connect those cameras on the FPGA via the MIPI CSI2 connection. The kit also has a FMC slot in order to extend the transceivers. We have a PCI Gen 2x4 slot. We have two HDMI ports, one for input and one for outputting the image. We have two gigabit Ethernet Mac connections that uh, connect directly to the MSS uh, gigabit Ethernet Mac ports. We have a microbus connection for your microbus shields. Uh, there's a DSI or MIPTX connection, which can be used to connect to display. Finally, we have SD card and an EMMC, both multiplex to the FPGA, which, which is typically used to boot up, store the Linux image and boot up Linux. So the next kit I just wanted to quickly highlight is our lower cost version. We call it as the Polar Fire SOC Icicle Kit. It is a lower featured kit, does not have the additional sort of peripherals that we had on the video kit. It only has the PCI slot. We have a Raspberry Pi connection. There's a microbus connection and it has access to two gigabit Ethernet ports. This is essentially intended for you to get quickly started on evaluating the RISC-V ecosystem. Okay, so I'm also really interested in how we can integrate Linux into our edge nodes like you were mentioning in the beginning. Can we take a closer look at that aspect? Yeah, there are two aspects to this. We have in-house Linux support, and we also have a sprawling RISC-V ecosystem, which we call as MyFi. Our collaterals, our firmware, our software is all stored in GitHub, and it is accessible to any customer. We've categorized all our offerings into like three or four different categories. For Linux builds, internally, we support Yocto and BuildRoot. We also maintain Zephyr and Artem's RTOS ports. If you want to understand how our bootloader system works, so there are three different types. There is the hard software system services, which is invoked by the system controller that basically allows you to control various aspects of how the FPG and the SOC boots up. There's a zero stage bootloader that is used if you are implementing a secure boot kind of a reference design. 
And then we also offer access to the system monitor subsystem, which is basically a RISC V based 64 bit MCU that acts as a system controller. So you have Linux that can run, you have RTOS that can run on the SOC, but you can also run the SOC in bare metal without any operating system. But in order to do that, we need to ensure that all the drivers for the bare metal system is also provided. We call it as HAL or hardware extraction layers. And we also provide all peripheral drivers in all the kits that we support. And finally, we support two reference designs with Polify SOC. We provide all the drivers upstream into a support package, which we call as BSPs. So this Mi 5 ecosystem has a lot of support from the industry, right? The biggest work that we've done is enabling this ecosystem. But gone are the days where customers would say, hey, ARM is new. I do not have any support from the ecosystem. I might be using Green Hill software with ARM, but is there a Green Hill software port in Mi 5? The answer is yes. Since we launched this about two years ago, we have over 65 partners who closely work with us in basically populating this ecosystem. The Sci-5 designed as the hardware SOC, but they also provide us the soft SOC that needs to run on our non-SOC Polar Fire FPG. We have support from operating systems and RTOS vendors. So RTEMS is very, very common in space customers. ROS is very common in industrial customers, robotic operating system. We have free RTOS support from Amazon, support from Ubuntu, FreeBSD. You name the OS or RTOS, I can assure you that we are either having support today or we are on the way to get support for those OS and RTOS operating systems. We have hardware partners who enable us in creating SAW modules. We have design services partners who can help you create your own designs. If you're struggling with some new design that you're unsure of, they can come in and help you create those. And then we have middleware partners who can help you with creating modules, system models, simulators. Maybe you want to have an additional security pack that runs on top of our security. So we really have worked a lot and we've seen the love from all these processor subsystems. Okay. So let's talk about some Polar Fire SOC applications. What kind of use cases would this solution be a good fit for? So our FPGAs are extremely successful in the smart embedded vision market. If you want to make a 4K60 camera and you want to make it really small where you do not need to put a heat sink or a thermal fan, you have to make it really thermally efficient, we offer the lowest power solution. If you want the camera to have security features because it will be probably installed in a remote location and you are afraid that somebody might come in and steal your IP, we have the best-in-class security. If you want those cameras to basically be on satellites with radiation environments or in a smart grid application where you're trying to monitor high-voltage power lines, we have the best-in-class reliability solution. Architecture is very, very good in terms of protecting against soft errors that might creep in due to high energy particle strikes. Smart embedded vision is one of the use cases where we really are seeing a lot of success, uh, Polar Fire and Polar Fire SOC portfolio. We provide a lot of IPs to our customers to get started. So we support sensor interfaces like MIPI CSI and SLVSCC. We support display interfaces like MIPI Transmit and MIPI DSI. A lot of basic image processing IPs, starting from color space conversions, edge detection, image enhancements, histograms, so and so forth. We have our own machine learning suite called Vector Blocks. We provide IPs for encode and decode. We are right now providing H.264 and MJPEG compression. And then we provide transport interfaces like CoExpress for industrial cameras and medical, SDI for broadcast, 10 gig server small form factor applications, HDMI and DisplayPort for more broadcast and commercial applications. But what this block diagram also shows on the top, sort of purple violet color, are all the other components that Microchip provides in addition to the FPGA. So when we talk about embedded vision, we not only provide an FPGA and a platform, we provide soft solutions and also other components like power over Ethernet, LDOs, oscillators, and FIs, all from the microchip family that enables you to basically have a single point of contact when you're talking about a complicated design. My first solution, we're just trying to show how a MIPI CSI2 camera captures images how that image is processed. 
and how that image processing algorithms and contexts are controlled using bare metal. So there's no Linux running onto this. Great. Okay. So Diptesh, what about streaming over Ethernet? I would imagine that this kind of application would be a good fit for the Polar Fire SOC. Absolutely. When you talk about Linux getting into the mix of embedded vision, the real benefit that customers get are existing libraries that are already developed by someone in Linux. And the ability for us to use those libraries makes the job of a system designer really easy. At the bottom is a typical camera demo. We are capturing the image and running some image signal processing algorithms. And at the end of it, we are trying to compress that algorithm using H.264. So a typical 10, uh, 4K60 image is being compressed into H.264 frames. Then what we do is we take those frames up to the second box where we are encoding or we are packetizing those frames into FFmpeg. FFmpeg is an industry standard container or a wrapper. And the easiest way to use FFmpeg is to just get a Linux-based FFmpeg software API rather than trying to make that codec in RTL on the FPGA side, which is extremely complicated. So that's the first benefit of having Linux. If you want a streaming image to be put into a container, which is industry standard, you just use Linux. And then we transfer the data out through the Ethernet cable, which can be connected to a laptop or a PC, and then using a VLC player or a G-streamer, which can basically decode that FFmpeg image, a customer can easily see the video. Now, the other benefit of using Linux is the communication back. So let's say you want to control each and every aspect of your camera. The way you send signal back is using the same gigabit Ethernet line. And the way you receive the signal is when you run an Apache web server in Linux. So that's the top layer of this block diagram. We are running a web server which basically captures commands. And then we pass it on to another application which is very, very popular in the Linux ecosystem, which is called V4L2, or Video for Linux. So V4L2 has APIs that can connect to the camera sensor so that you can configure the sensor while booting up. You can also configure each and every aspects of the IPs that is mentioned in the bottommost block because V4L2 provides those connectivity protocols. So what about industrial Internet of Things applications? OPC UA stands for Open Platform Communication Unified Architecture. What it essentially means is it is a platform independent protocol that can be run on any device. But the beauty of this protocol is it is adopted by all the major OEMs in the world. It is standardized, it has security inbuilt, and it follows the rules that every other component has to adhere to. And once that is done, you can send metadata, you can send performance indicators, you can run maintenance algorithms, all the way from a single industrial node all the way to the cloud. So it's an open platform. That means anyone can develop it, recognized by most major OEMs today in the world. And it is extremely extensible. So it can be run on FPGAs and SOC FPGAs. So what about AI applications? Yeah, if you think about autonomous driving, a lot of people are thinking about how to get it done using AI. And there are AI-based autonomous driving models that are available. And then there are extremely simple AI applications that might be used in commercial applications, like trying to identify a person's head and then turning on the light. So you're trying to detect a person rather than an animal. And when the person is detected, you say that there's an occupant inside the room and time for you to turn on the lights. So in this spectrum of extremely simple AI to extremely complicated AI, PolarFire SOC targets applications which require low power consumption or extremely power efficient AI. And if anyone wants security, low power and reliability along with AI, that's where we really come into the picture and that's where we start getting into customer designs. We have a software development kit called Vectorblocks that enables you to run neural networks on our FPGAs. We provide you the tools that enable you to convert your neural networks, CAFE or Onyx or MXNet or PyTorch. If you have used these frameworks to train your neural networks, you can convert them using our tools and run on our FPGAs. 
But with microchips, polar fire SOC, FPGAs, and vector blocks, we target applications which are constrained on power, which require really high-end security. If you need FPGA that is radiation tolerant in space, we have the best-in-class solution today. Okay. So, Diptesh, are there any other use cases that we haven't covered that you'd like my audience to keep in mind? Yeah, I did not cover one of the most unique differentiator of our SOC FPGA, which is called asymmetric multiprocessing. Typically, if you need to run real-time operating system, which is time-critical, and let's say feature-rich operating system like Linux, which has a lot of features, but it is not deterministic, you choose a FPG or an SOC which has dual cluster cores, one core, one cluster for real-time, one cluster for Linux. But Polarify SOC basically offers you to run two operating systems on a single CPU core. As you can see in the image below, we have the capability to run Linux and RTOS on the single CPU cluster where RTOS can run on one of the cores and you can run Linux on the three other cores. And the way we enable this is by memory partitioning that ensures that Linux does not eat into the cache or the DDR that is used for running RTOS. So RTOS can stay real-time and deterministic, while Linux can be non-deterministic, but also offer a lot of benefit, like running OPC UA, for example, or running Apache web server, or you might want to use FFmpeg for encoding the video stream that you see. So in this slide, we have two kits, Polarfire Icicle Kit 1 and Polarfire Icicle Kit 2. Both of the kits are used to connect to two vibration sensors that we have placed on a piece of acrylic sheet. So the ribbon at the top is a glass acrylic sheet. We have placed two sensors on them that you see on the red side. And then each of the icicle kits has the Polify SOC that runs a real-time OS or an RTOS that is connected directly to the sensor. And it also runs Linux. Once you tap, let's say, on the left side of the glass, you expect the vibrations of the tap to be received by sensor on the first kit faster than the vibrations that the sensor 2 on the second kit will receive. So once a glass is tapped, shock sensors basically detect those vibrations. We generate an interrupt to each of the RTOS system. The RTOS immediately then gets a timestamp value from the gigabit Ethernet max that we have on Polarify SOC. At every time you tap, you extract a timestamp from the Mac side. The two gigabit Ethernet Macs are PTP synchronized. So the timestamp that you get from both gigabit Ethernet Macs will tell you the exact same time. If you know the exact same time and you are capturing the timestamps, then you can tell the difference between the timestamp at sensor 1 and timestamp at sensor 2. And then you can basically figure out the difference between the two timestamps to validate whether the tap happened on the left side or the tap happened on the right side. As soon as the taps are received and the RTOS gets the timestamp, RTOS sends those timestamp values to Linux. And those values are logged on the Linux operating system. Now, the Linux on Icicle Kit 1 is running a web server, whereas Linux on Icicle Kit 2 is running a web client. What happens is we get the web client on Linux 2 to send the timestamp value from kit 2 to kit 1. So now we have in kit 1 both the timestamps of sensor 1 and sensor 2 located in a single location. What we do is we create a CSV file. That file can be then accessed by the host, which is a PC at the center, and then we can compare the timestamp values. Okay, so if my audience wants more information about Polar Fire SOCs, where should they go? So most of our information available on our website, but we do have a lot of resources in terms of technical trainings that are stored in our on-demand webinar platform called On24. We have webinars that enable you to understand and learn how things work with Polar Fire SOC, how you implement security, how is AI, ML, and vector block solutions implemented? How do you debug the fabric? How do you boot the SOC using your software flow? What are the different ways of asymmetric multiprocessing solutions that you can implement and so on and so forth? So we have a bunch of resources, whether they are webinars or technical resources that you can learn more about. So Diptesh, can you recap your main points for me? Yes, absolutely. 
I would like you to remember just three things. Our FPGAs are extremely competent and differentiated whenever it comes to power efficiency, whenever it comes to security. We actually call it defense grade security. And whenever you need really reliable FPGAs for your designs, we have the first RISC-V based SOC FPGA in the market. And we have a very, very comprehensive My5 ecosystem so that you can take the help of our partners as well to solve your problems. We know that the challenges that we face when we are trying to develop an industrial edge or an edge kind of a solution is power, security, and reliability. And we ensure that whatever solutions that we make are targeted towards supporting you in solving those problems for the edge application. All right, so I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks a lot. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Microchip. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.